Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Yasser Hanif. Um, as uh, Mohsen introduced me, I work as an um, orthopedic department in Kettering General Hospital. And uh, today we are going to discuss about a very important uh, topic in the orthopedic department, which is called uh, neck of femur fracture. I would say like uh, neck of femur fracture is what we call is the bread and butter of orthopedic. You will understand how important it is for the orthopedicians to uh, identify, diagnose, treatment, and uh, post-operative management of the people who have neck of femur fracture. So um, I think everyone knows what neck of femur, neck of femur actually it is, uh, the femur itself, what it, exactly it is. We go with a little bit of anatomy. I'm not a big fan of anatomy, but it has to be really, <clears throat> excuse me, pogging my throat is a bit sore today because I've been COVID positive recently. So um, let's go with the structures uh, and the anatomy of the femur and the uh, the neck of femur itself, which is very important today. So the structures uh, of the head and neck is, uh, uh, is developed from the transmission of body weight efficiently and uh, minim to minimize the bone mass by appropriate distribution of the uh, bony trabecula in the, in the neck. So what I just want to uh, try to make this presentation quite simple and straightforward to understand at the end of the presentation, we'll have at least key points in our fingertips that what we learn from this presentation, what is important, what is actually important things that we learn from this presentation today that are, you are going to carry with you for the rest of your lives so that you will be very beneficial whenever you encounter maybe an F1, F2, maybe an SHO level or in your further trainings, whenever you encounter any neck or femur fracture patient. So you'll be able to have a fair idea about how to manage or how to treat or how what's the important next step that you want to go with it. So as I mentioned, the part one would be anatomy. Like as you understand, everyone knows we have a femur bone. We have two femur bones on the both sides. Uh, it has a soft round ball structure and uh, which is uh, the head. It is connected to the rest of the body of the femur bone by a structure called neck. As you can see in the diagram, I can, if you can see my cursor here, the rounded structure here, head. This is the rest of the structure from here. It starts the shaft of the femur bone. And this portion, what we call is generalized as a neck. There are important um, landmarks on the anatomy, if we can see from here. If you can see my cursor where I'm pointing right now, this is called the greater trochanter. And uh, somewhere near here, it's called lesser trochanter. Um, we'll come more about it. Is uh, the primarily it works as a transmission of the weight from the whole body uh, and the trunk. It goes through the leg, it goes to the legs through this joint. So it's very important as a weight bearing joint in the body. And um, the tension, what we call as, we can see from here, uh, the top of the body, this portion forms a joint with the acetabulum of the pelvis. And uh, the whole body weight goes down like this and it compresses. As you can see the arrow here, it's called a compression arcade. It kind of compresses and the same, force is then distributed to the rest of the bone in the femur shaft by this little arc, which is called tensile arc, okay? So far, nothing special, no rocket science. Compression force is uh, distributed into tensile arc gate to go into the legs. That's how a body stands on the femur. Simple from this slide, I would say. Little bit more anatomy, like blood supply, how the joint is formed. So um, but whenever we talk about uh, anatomy of any structure, we go with the bony structures and landmarks. I'm sure you will get more information on, from an anatomy book than I could give you on the sim simple presentation about regarding the neck of femur, regarding the femur itself, regarding the hip joint itself. So um, a little bit more anatomy like the head is connected to the shaft by neck, which is about roughly about 3.7 centimeter, 3 centimeter long. And um, it makes an angle of uh, roughly 130 plus or minus seven degrees um, at the juncture between the head and the shaft. The, ang uh, the neck makes an angle of 130, uh, roughly 130, 30 degrees. I want to highlight a very important aspect here, which is called medial uh, calcar form femoral. Uh, nothing special. It is just a portion of the bone on the medial side. If you can see my arrow going from top to bottom, 
like this. This portion of bone is a little bit more stronger and it's more um, mineralized from the rest of the bone. So this arc from here, which is what we call as medial calca or calca fem femoral. Um, we'll talk more about it later in the presentation, what is, why it's so important and what's the significance of it. And as you can see from the diagram, the blood supply of the uh, neck of femur going towards the head and the shaft as well. Uh, the primary, I would say, uh, blood supply comes from the deep femoral artery, has a medial circumflex artery, has ascending transverse arteries and the branches and they communicate with the branches which come from the um, other arteries. And they form a meshwork, which is uh, if someone asks you a very important question, okay, give me one simple uh, solution or one simple answer for circulation of neck of femur, you would say it's a complex meshwork of arteries, which is called retinacular arteries or retinacular meshwork of arteries. I think that will be sufficient and um, more appropriate answer. So one answer, uh, or one thing that you learn from this slide would be a retinacular artery, uh, a meshwork that supplies around the neck and the estabulum of the neck of, femur, neck of femur. Now we understand a little bit more about the angulation, the head, the shaft, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, blood supply. Now we come to the main topic, which is, which is a fracture of the neck of femur. So most fractures are displaced with distal fragment. Um, if I go back, we would say in this diagram, we would say this will be the proximal portion of hip joint. This will be the distal portion of hip joint. And this is neck itself. And that means that simple as the term itself says, neck of femur is broken, it's fractured. That's called neck of femur fracture in basic terms. It's, uh, what happens is that the distal portion, the, as I showed you in the diagram before, the distal portion, what happens to that once the neck, the junction between the head and the shaft of the bone, when it's broken, the bridge is broken, what happens to the distal, that means the shaft portion of the bone, what happens to that? It gets externally rotated like this. Uh, it might show you the mirror image in the wrong way, but I have images to show you in a better way. It gets adducted and it gets proximally migrated. I will show you how, how what does it actually means and what's the clinical significance this medical jargon doesn't make any sense if you can't apply in a practical way in a when you're working in a hospital or in ed and when you see okay that those three terms will make more sense and i'll show you how the like next uh, paragraph is uh, more exaggeration of the same things which will make sense in the next uh, slide uh, these displacements are less marked than an intertrochantic fracture because of the hip joint uh, is attached to the distal fragment and prevents ex extreme rotations and displacement of the distal fragment. Uh, let me try to explain it before it makes more confusion. So uh, let's have a look at this diagram here. You can see a portion of the pelvis here. Uh, this is a ball and socket joint that's present in our hip. As you can see, this is a acetabulum that forms the cavity for the joint. And this is the femoral head that makes the ball and socket joint. That's the neck. And if you can see this whitish portion, this would be called as the capsule of the neck of uh, femur or the, or the hip joint, the capsule. Uh, let me explain a little bit more. Any fracture, as you can see, the neck's extending from head till here. Any fracture that occurs within this capsule is called intracapsular. It's more of a classification of uh, neck of femur fractures. Basic ones, very simple one, easy to understand and remember. Anything that happens, any fracture that occurs or happens in, within this capsule would be called as intracapsular neck of femur fracture. And any fracture that takes place outside this capsule, that means from here till almost here, would be called as extra capsule, okay? Sometimes what happens is that a fracture line can extend from, as you can see my arrow going down, from greater trochanter, an oblique line like this goes to the lesser trochanter, which will be called as intertrochantic, intertrochantric neck of femur fracture, okay? And any fracture that takes place within the capsule is called Intracapsular. In other words, a, 
any intertrochanteric fracture would be called as in broadly as extra trochanteric fracture, okay? Or uh, extra capsular, sorry, extra capsular, which would be in other terms called intertrochanteric fracture, which is more important once you are working in hospital and um, some person who is not able to walk, uh, an elderly person who had a fall and uh, comes with a severe excruciating pain in the hip, not able to walk on the leg. And previous slides I mentioned, the leg will be short, leg will be externally rotated, it will be adducted towards the body. And um, what would be a next step? Do an X-ray of the hip. And what do you see in that? Uh, somewhat like this. You can see the head is here on the X-ray. This is the vestibular cavity. This is greater trochanter, if you're following my arrow, lesser trochanter. And you can see the break here. So as I, as I explained to you, the capsule will be extending from here to here. So what kind of fracture would it be? I understand. You might be saying it's intracapsular. Yes, you're right. Intracapsular necrofemal fracture because it is taking place within the capsule. It is necrofemal, obviously, but it's intracapsular, okay? Okay, let's go with other one. Now, you see the difference between this one and this one. Both are necrofemal fractures, but you can see the difference in this one is that you can see the head, you can see the acetabulum, you can see the neck. Neck is intact. If you can see this, neck is intact. But the fracture line you can see from going from almost like greater trochanter, running down to the lesser trochanter. What kind of fracture would it be? Extra capsular, definitely. And obviously it's a neck of femur fracture, but it's extra capsular. Or in other terms, it is intertrochantric because it's extending from the greater trochanter, going to the lesser trochanter. Intertrochantric extra capsular neck of femur fracture. Intracapsular neck of femur fracture, this one. And this is extra capsular intertrochantric neck of femur fracture. I think these are the, 90% of the presentations in hospital, whenever a patient you suspect neck of femur fracture, you would see more or less those two x-rays, nothing special. Very rarely you will see extra things uh, which might be uh, present because of the other uh, bony pathologies, osteoporosis or many other things. But these two x-rays, you will be like this, making a diagnosis that it's a neck of femur fracture, it's intracapsular. And this is this one is intracapsular, extracapsular, and try to be more smart. Say extracapsular intertrochanteric fracture because it's running from the greater trochanter to lesser trochanter. So far, you understand a little bit of anatomy. Medial calca is a strong portion of the bone that runs from here to here, just like this. Where the strongest strongest portion of the what we call is the neck of femur. Broad classification: intracapsular. X-rays here. This is intracapsular neck of femur fracture, extracapsular. For example, one of them is intertrochanteric fracture. It's really, it's, it's, it's like uh, medical term, terminology. Um, let's say if fracture, if you go on the first image on here, you can see my cursor. Fracture extending from the greater trochanter going to the lesser trochanter, obviously extracapsular, no doubt in that. But this one would you would call as intertrochanteric because it's going from greater trochanter to lesser trochanter, right? Okay, a fracture line coming from this portion, if you, if you can see my arrow and going, sorry for that, going from here and going straight to this portion, what would you call that? Extra capsular, right? But it would be more usually called as subtrochanteric because trochanters are here. This is greater trochanter. This is lesser trochanter, and it's just below the trochanter. So what we call it as subtrochanteric. So these are how the terminology and classifications are made: intercapsular, extracapsular. Extracapsular has further subparts like intertrochanteric, subtrochanteric, and it and the classification goes on and on. Right. So far, a couple of points very important to understand and learn and to keep with you for the rest of your life. Let's move next slide. As I was saying, we all will be doctors, you all will be doctors, and somewhere, somewhere you will be working ED, 
as a rotational job or as a long-term job, whatever. Um, physical presentation examination will be uh, 80 to 90 percent times would be an elderly male or female uh, who, who or she was struggling with the mobile mobility <clears throat> or she was freely mobile before in uh, late 70s or early 90s uh, the it varies from 70 to 90. Um, I'm giving a very broad and idealistic picture of how the patients present to the hospital when they have a neck or femur fracture. I was walking, had a little bit of uh, vertigo, a little bit of uh, um, dizziness. Uh, most times they try to make you move, twisted and fell down just from a standing height. Uh, was going out from the house to the garden, missed a step, fell down. Um, was trying to go to the toilet, slipped, fell down. So after that, they were not able to get up. They were not able to put any weight on the leg, which is affected. So it will be like 90% your diagnosis already confirmed by the examination and the history that neck of femur fracture. So the person, when he or she will be brought to the uh, hospital, will be in the trolley or in the bed like this. You can see in the first image, my cursor here, uh, right leg is fine because if a person who is in the, who has fractured his uh, hip would be in this presentation, which is like the left leg, right leg looks fine. You can see the foot on the right side looks okay. And the left side, which is broken is externally rotated now it makes sense. External rotation of the broken hip or broken leg will be like this. As you can see very easily from here, you can make a differentiation. The right leg is fine, perfectly fine. You can see the left leg externally rotated, okay? It's because of the muscle bulk, which is attached the quadriceps, the gluteus maximus from the buttocks and from the thigh muscles. They have a very strong force. Once the neck is broken, it's broken and the, the pull of those muscles, the pull of the muscle, they pull it like that. And it's like this. Uh, you can see it from the other image as well. It is shortened, isn't it? You can see from this image easily, the right leg is normal. It's of straight length, but the broken hip, you can see it's short. It's not the position of the patient, it's actually short. It's always like that. So you can see it's short and it's externally rotated, external rotation internal rotation, normal leg, normal foot, external rotation, okay? And um, if you can palpate, like once you are the, working as a doctor or you are working as right now as a doctor, if you can palpate at the hip joint, you can see the bump or you can see a bit of uh, deformity in the hip as well. If a, per if a person or the patient is a little, little bit skinny, you can appreciate it more easily as compared to a, a well-built or chubby person. Uh, you can see that the broken portion, the broken uh, portion of the hip, a broken portion of the shaft of the femur will be a little bit backwards. You can, if you can palpate on the hip side, you can feel a bony projection there, which will not be present on the normal side, okay? It will be more exaggerated on the broken side. So ideal situation, any of uh, our grandparents, usually like the, my grandparent had a hip, hip fracture, had a fall, elderly person had a fall, twisted or just fell down from a normal standing height, was not able to walk on this leg afterwards immediately. And more important, more important is the excruciating pain in the broken hip. It's very, very painful. Imagine broken bone, you are having a trauma, you broke a bone, there will be bleeding, there will be injury to the nerves and vessels around it. It's really, really painful. Like one of the worst pains one can uh, ever experience in, in his or her life. So it's really painful. So as I can see the physical examination, you will be like, the person is not able to bear weight after a long fall, a standing. You can see, imagine your grandpa or grandma standing and she, she just felt and just fell on side. You went to her, tried to get her up. She is not able to walk at all. She's crying in the pain. Just let her be like that, keep her on the back. Don't move leg, don't try to pull it up, don't try to uh, pick it up the leg. 
it is really painful. It causes a lot of pain. Um, leg will be shortened, adducted, externally rotated. It makes sense now, as you can see from the pictures. Classical presentation, it, it doesn't show any other presentation, usually 90% of the cases. And commonly present in the elderly people. And uh, sometimes uh, young people can also have, who don't have any bony pathologies, osteoporosis or anything, young people like me, you, they can also have neck or femur fracture, but they need a very strong and traumatic force, particularly on the side of the hip. Um, I seen a patient who was 25 year old young chap. Um, he was driving a quad bike, quad car and had tried to, had a flip at something and uh, fell down and the quad bike fell on his hip and he broke his uh, hip. Uh, um, next thing would be like, the immediate thing that you, you what you would like to see is that uh, on here, we have dorsal spadius artery. Just try to palpate without pushing or uh, pulling the leg or doing anything to the leg. Just try to check the palpate with two fingers or three fingers or even thumb. Try to palpate uh, just right here to see if, if they have a circulation. Usually they have a good circulation. That means vascularity is intact and um, try to just, uh, check for the sensations, touch with the cotton wisp or with the finger as well sometimes. Just go and ask the patient, can you feel my touch on your foot? That means neurovascular, it's intact. So clinically in the hospital, you are very sure now if you come a patient, it's not uncommon, it's really, really common. As you can see, like on an average in small country like UK, we have an, on an average like 75,000 to 80,000 people who get annually treated and get neck or femur fractures and get annually operated. So it's a big number and very common fracture. It's not like it's very uncommon. You won't see ever, you, you definitely going to see lots of many patients, elderly people, middle aged people, they will come with a neck or femur. And it's a big thing, it's a huge thing because it carries a very high risk mortality with it if it's not treated or prompted uh, to treat at the earliest. So, so far you understand, you can diagnose at least with a little bit of X-ray, uh, with a little bit of examination, you know it. So, so far you are diagnosed the patient, you've done the X-ray, now you're sure. Well, you diagnosed the neck of femur fracture, congratulations. What next? Um, the neck of femur fracture definitely needs an operation to treat. There's no other way it's going to heal on its own. It's a weight bearing joint. So definitely if it's left like this, the hip joint is a big joint. It will accumulate blood. The patient can die of hypovolemic shock. Patient won't be able to walk at all on this leg if it's not treated, that's operated. So patient will be, have no mobility at all. It's the severe excruciating pain one can experience. So he'll be literally bedridden, it's just like, a zombie laying down in the bed. So definitely it's an operation. Um, but operations, as you see, the hospital is always busy. It's not like the, you saw the patient and just straight to the uh, theaters. Maybe happens sometimes if they have vacancies, there's a long list waiting on and everything. But the uh, British um, Association of Orthopedics, BAO, uh, they have made a guideline that any neck of femur fracture should be treated within 72 hours of the presentation to hospital. So the moment the patient lands in the hospital, that's counted as the counting clock starts. And within 72 hours, the patient should be operated. Uh, it, it was usually before it was 24 hours, then it was extended to 48 hours. Then now finally they have settled down to 72 hours. Every surgeon, even my department, we try to operate within 24 hours. Uh, but some patients, certain patients, they get delayed. It's, it's, there are a lot many factors to you know, do an operation. There are anesthetic risks, there are other risks. Some patients have lost a lot of blood, they need transfusion. Some patients have comorbidities that um, you know, defy them from the surgeries. So we have to make sure before we take the patient to the uh, operation theater or theater table, they are in a very good situation before we operate on them. Some patients are really on high blood thinners the INR is very high and they are not operable at the same time. So we have to make sure their blood is quite not that thin and they will bleed to death in the theater table if we go for the surgery straight away. 
But as a, as a junior doctor, you as a F1, F2, or as a junior doctor, or SHO on call, or the CT1 on call, there are a lot many things that you can do to improve the outcome of any patient who has a neck or femur fracture. At the same time, you will make their stay in the hospital at the same time very comfortable. There are a lot many things that you can do, which British Association of Orthopedics has devised in the form of big six. It's a good term and it's a very valid term in the orthopedics, or it's also sometimes called a super six. Six, six. So six things you have to do for a neck or femur fracture patient and you tick them one by one and you have done your job. I guarantee that. As a junior doctor, obviously you're not going to do operate. You have to have a lot of trainings and everything, but you will be assisting some days. So some days you'll be doing theaters uh, on your own. But these are the six things that you do from your point, from your side, that at least you give patients benefit. The patient will be at least pain-free at the end of it. First thing, uh, provision of pain relief. Pain relief can be given in the form of IV paracetamol, morphine, um, codeine, so many, uh, according to the pain later, we usually give morphine because you will understand it's the most severe, it's severe, it's the most severe pain you can experience. So definitely they need it. Um, second thing, uh, what we do is call it screening of delirium. As I mentioned, like 90, 80, 90% of patients are elderly. We have to make sure they are not in delirium, which is a temporary state of confusion. Um, we have a chart, which I will discuss in the next slide how we really do all those things. And it doesn't take much time, honestly. It hardly takes two to five minutes to do all those uh, six steps to get the patient in line uh, in the track. Early warning scoring, it's a simple, of, uh, co it's a combination of the vitals that you do or your nurse colleague will do and make sure the patient is not using height. Uh, high news means patients is severe or critical. Uh, normal news zero to two means patient is fine and stable at the moment. It, it, it involves like blood pressure, temperature, uh, respiratory rate, heart rate, um, all those things combined together. I will show you in the next slide. Um, at the same time, once the patient is in the ED, we just take a sample of blood and run all the basic routine tests, ABC, UNE, electrolytes, uh, check for any clotting uh, pathology or clotting problems, INR, and run all those basic tests to make sure and at the same time, you do an ECG, electrocardiogram. Now, most of the patients, they have comorbidities associated with the uh, neck or femur fracture, uh, pacemaker sometimes, uh, sometimes mild MI, they also present with it. And at the same time, as I mentioned, that the hip joint is a big joint. It has a good capacity to at least uh, accumulate 2.5 liters of blood in tops. So that's a big amount of blood, a huge amount of blood that will go from the vessels, out of the vessels into the joint, which is not actually running in the body as a circulation. So definitely you need to give intravenous fluids so that the blood pressure is maintained. And the pressure area care, which is usually done by the nurses and the healthcare assistants, they just check the pressure areas, the you know, sectoral soles, heels, uh, elbows, neck, to make sure that they're not having any pressure areas or pressure sores. So let's, uh, provision of pain, uh, uh, you would say like, it's just a normal thing. Anyone who complains of pain should be given painkillers. Yeah, I think that's the basic thing that we should do. But um, there's a one special thing, which is called uh, fascia iliaca block. This is something different from, as a pain relief for the patients who had neck or femur fracture. Let me explain it. It's very good, a very uh, a good uh, technique to learn. It, just takes the pain away within five minutes. The patient who came in in ambulance crying, literally crying, sobbing in pain and just crying and crying, they give the injection and after five minutes, they are at least you know, in relaxed position for almost like six, seven hours or eight hours until they get operated. So uh, what we do in this fascia iliaca block, uh, there's a fascia which is called fascia iliaca that runs from the iliac cross and goes down in the uh, over the muscles of the quadriceps and goes in the tibial tuberosity. You might need to more, uh, read more about it. Um, as you can see, um, I think this is one of the important points. If you learn something fascia iliaca block today, this will definitely give you a top notch from other people or from other students or fellow 
uh, students that you know something uh, different from a common person or from a, your contemporaries. Uh, that's why I just try to focus two, three minutes more on this. Apart from painkillers, the normal morphine, paracetamol, we usually give fascia iliaca block. It is called FIB, FIB, or fascia iliaca block. Or you simply say in the ED and the orthopedics, we call it block. Has the patient got a block? So what's the block? Um, so as you can see on the first way to give, so it's a, it has a landmark where exactly you want to give a fascia iliaca block. In the uh, emergency department, we expose the patient obviously with prior consent and have a chaperone with you so that um, you're not exposing a patient without any chaperone. And with the prior consent that you're going to give an injection in the hip that will take the pain away for six, seven or up to eight hours. And uh, everyone wants that obviously, they don't want pain. So how will you do it? That the, it has to be, you have the first thing, you have to find landmarks. The first landmark, if we can see from this image here, this dot, is anterior superior iliac spine, A-S-I-S, -S, anterior superior iliac spine, easily palpable. You can palpate on yourself here, it's mine. Anterior superior iliac spine here. Second landmark would be pubic tubercle on here, on the medial side of the same leg. Here, pubic tubercle here on the medial side, anterior superior iliac spine, on the spiolectal side here. And you can draw a line from here to here. If, and if someone's anatomy is good, what does those two joint structures have? It's a kind of band that runs from the anterior superior iliac spine goes to pubic tubercle. It's called inguinal ligament. I'm sure most of you guys know. So the ligament runs from the anterior superior iliac spine, goes to pubic tubercle, okay? And uh, you can have a little tape with you, or you can just roughly say it's of, uh, from here to here. Now you divide anterior, uh, this line, which runs from the anterior superior iliac spine to pubic tubercle into three portions, uh, into uh, three uh, halves. It's medial one third, it's middle one third and the lateral one third, you can say, okay? Medial one third, middle one third, and the lateral one third, okay? Right. In the, and the junction between the middle one third and the lateral one third would be the site somewhere where you give the injection, okay? So you can also palpate in the middle one third, your femoral artery. You go with the fingers. If you go from your pubic tubercle, you go from with two, three fingers, start from here and go to laterally, check for the femoral artery. Somewhere here, you will find femoral artery palpating, very pulsating. So always go lateral to that. And in the line of inguinal ligament, 2.5 centimeter below, make a mark there and you give the block injection like this. Uh, the block is nothing special. It contains lidocaine. Uh, usually give according to the weight of the body or the person. Um, it's, uh, if a person is more than 70 kilograms, you give 35 mils of lidocaine. If it's uh, from 60 to 70, you give 30. And uh, less than 60, you give 25 mils. So um, one important thing, I got a syringe by the way here. So what you do is that you pre-fill up everything according to the body weight, fill up everything. and um, you have your landmarks now, and you just really expand to go in one line, medial one third, um, middle one third junction. You know the uh, femoral artery. You always go lateral to the femoral artery. There's why on the on this image you can see here, femoral artery is here. You palpate it. You always go lateral to that. You can always give here in this portion. Keep your syringes filled with the lidocaine according to the body weight. Then you obviously have to be under aseptic environment, you clean it, change your gloves. You have the landmark already known. Then you take it like this. Uh, it needs a special needle. Uh, it's not a special one, but I would say it's not a sharp needle. The needle is a very blunt needle. If you can see, it's very blunt needle. Red, large gauge, uh, blunt needle. It doesn't need a sharp needle. 
So what's the benefit of this is that if when, once you go, the blunt needle will help you uh, with two things. First, for, it has uh, what you oh, what usually call as a famously called as two pop, one pop and two pop. So what, what does that actually mean? If it's a sharp needle, the sharp needle pierces the skin without causing any noise. You, so you won't hear anything. A no pop will be here if it's a sharp needle. It's very important. That's why we, why we use a blunt needle. Once the blunt needle goes through a skin, it makes a pop like pop and goes through the muscles without making any noise. Then you reach the fascia. Fascia is also tough. The first pop will be, you will hear when, once you pierce the skin because it's a blunt needle, pop here, smooth. Once you reach the fascia, there will be another pop like pop. So two pops, that means you are in a good position with a blunt red needle. I use this usually. And a little bit aspiration, make sure you're not in the artery. You have pre-filled syringes, fill it up slowly, make sure patient is comfortable. Uh, for filling it, it hardly takes two, three minutes. Uh, make sure patient's comfortable and uh, tell your nurse colleague, or if you are free, you can do observations, check the vitals, patient's okay. And obviously you have to make sure patient's not allergic to lidocaine before injecting. So this is a very miraculous thing. I've seen patients when they come in the ED department with broken hip, they are literally crying their lives up. I give the injection. Once I saw this patient, I gave the injection. I saw him after 15 minutes. He was trying to get out of the bed and walk. He thought the pain is like, it's taken away. It's, it's healed, it's fixed. And I had to explain it to him that it's not healed. It's just a painkiller. Don't get away, get out of the bed. You will break, you will just make it worse. You have to sit in the bed. You can't bear weight on the leg. So that's how miraculously it works. It, it definitely is a big thing. If you can take somebody's pain away, it's a big thing. Right, so uh, confusion, we have this 10 point scoring. You ask those questions to the person to make sure that they're not in confusion because um, um, neck or femur fracture or surgery is a big thing. It's a big operation in which we have to go through the different uh, ways or different surgeries. There's a little bit of uh, expected blood loss. It's done under general anesthesia. So all those things, they add up stress to the body and we have to make sure the patient is not uh, in, under any kind of any confusion, any delirium. Uh, the surgery has not added more stress to the brain itself. So it helps make sure that the patient's not in the confusion of delirium. So you can find this, this is called AMTS, uh, a preventive mental uh, test score, AMTS, comprised of 10 questions. You ask any person uh, those 10 questions. If they answer correctly, you give one, one marks to each. If they answer wrong, you cross that one and you add up 10 questions will be equal to 10 scores. A person having more than six is considered as mentally sane, mentally awake uh, oriented. Any person having a score of less than six is considered as uh, in delirium. So simple thing. You can do it on yourself, your friends. And um, as I mentioned, like early warning score in EWS, these are the all parts of the super six, the big six. Uh, this is like, as I mentioned, the combination of vitals, respiration, saturation, and the blood pressure. And uh, after all those things you're given, um, as I mentioned beforehand, uh, that the neck of femur surgery or the neck of femur fracture itself contains, uh, uh, carries a big percentage of mortality if it's not treated or operated within a given time. Um, uh, we have this, uh, which is called National Hip Fracture Mortality Score. Um, it is available. Uh, everywhere in the hospitals, particularly in the ED and the orthopedic department, you can make a fair rough idea about what is the percentage of mortality for this particular patient with the neck of femur fracture. Because those people are usually elderly, their next of kin, their daughter, son, they are more worried, like, will he make it through the surgery? It's a big question, obviously. Will your dad or will your grandma or grand, uh, granddad is going to make it? Um, well, you're not someone like uh, to give a 100% correct answer, 
but this uh, mortality score will give a fair idea and it actually works it uh, applies you can see very basic simple scores you can see uh, check those vitals check those things and details of the patient age according to age give the score it's a very simple thing uh, check any if the patient's any malignancy previously score one any other comorbidities score one is he living independently in his own house or is he living in a care home or an institution where people take care of him? Score one or zero. Uh, hemoglobin is it less than 10 grams, but deciliter is more than 10 grams according to the score of the patient. Sex, males have more propensity for mortality as compared to the females. And uh, age-wise, add, add up the score. Obviously, a more elderly person with less hemoglobin who's living in an institution who has more than two comorbidities, had a previous cancer, current cancer, or been treated with a cancer, will definitely have more mortality as compared to a normal healthy person. So it's a basic gist and a summary of it. So that's how you predict the mortality score. Like, is the 10% mortality? There's a 10% risk that he might not make it. Some people have like 40%. So it's a... I don't know. It's it's a 50-50 chance. I don't know. We'll try our best, but we're not sure. So that's how this actually gives an idea. So now you did your best. You did the fascia like a block injection, patient happy. Your consultant or the associate consultant is now planning the surgery. So surgery is now. Uh, I don't want to go very deep into this and make it very boring, like types of surgeries, what to do, what not what to do, what screw to do. And there's so many complexities in the surgery itself. I come to this conclusion that as I told you, as I taught you in the first slide, extra capsular, intra capsular, extra capsular. So extra capsular will be, um, as I mentioned, uh, those fractures are usually treated by two surgeries, either THS, which is called a dynamic hip screw or I am nailing, intramedullary nailing, and intracapsular fractures are usually operated with hemiarthroplasty or total hip replacement. Big discussion going on, which is better, which patient should receive which one. But if you know it, extracapsular necrofemur fractures, they're usually operated with DHS I am nailing or I am nailing, depending upon the surgeon's expertise, his choice, what he thinks is best for the patient. And obviously intracapsular, they usually operate with a hemiarthroplasty majority of the times. A young person who has intracapsular neck or femur fracture will be treated with a total hip replacement. Let's go with slowly, uh, quickly through those, and I think that will be enough. Uh, dynamic hip screw, DHS. A very common surgery done in an extracapsular neck or femur fracture. As you can see, it's... Um, it's it works on the tension band principle. If a fracture is here, let's see, this is a fracture line. We make a hole through this, put a lag screw through it to the head, and then the side plate is inserted and it's stabilized with the screw on the bone. And as the patient walks, this compresses uh, the broken sides together to make it more strong and to increase the contact area to let it heal quickly. So dynamic hip screw works like this way. I don't want to go into more details. I think that will be a big, huge topic. How does it work? Which patient should be uh, treated with DHS and which patient should be treated with, uh, operated with I am nailing. That's a big whole discussion. So I'm having a very quick uh, x-ray. These are two different x-rays on the, the image A, it's an x-ray of a dynamic hip screw. They look like similar. On the image B, it's a I am nailing. It, you might find a bit difference in, uh, if you can see, this is the fracture line. Let's talk about the image one. You can see the fracture is here. It's going, it's an extra capsule, definitely, as I said, it's here. It's going from the greater trochanter, running, running, running to the lesser trochanter, obviously extra capsule, and it's intertrochantric treated or operated with a dynamic hip screw. You can see this is called lag screw, which goes into it. This is barrel, 
side plate and these screws stabilize it. And the patient, once he starts mobilizing, the dynamic screw pushes those broken bones together and gets it compressed. Iron nailing works more or less on the same principle, but it's more of a stability of the shock of the fracture. If you can see the fracture is here, running from the lesser trochanter, almost going to the greater trochanter. And uh, extra capsule, obviously. This is not a lag screw, it's just a screw. And uh, this is the IM nail. It goes in the shaft deeper. It's inside the shaft. It's called, sorry, that's why it's called IM. Uh, let's talk about uh, hemiarthroplasty. As I mentioned uh, earlier, intracapsular neck of femur fractures are usually treated with hemiarthroplasty or total hip replacement. There's a discussion why a patient should go hemiarthroplasty or total hip replacement. That there are a lot many factors that contribute which patient should be treated with hemiarthroplasty and which patient should be treated with a total hip replacement. But more or less, uh, they are both for the fracture of neck of femur, which is intracapsular. You can see easily from this X-ray on this side, my arrow here. Trochanters are safe, neck is gone, head is here. So it's intracapsular, definitely. So this is the same treatment uh, operated. You can see this is a whole prosthesis. This is not a separate prosthesis. This is one piece prosthesis in which we have removed, replaced the broken head. And uh, this is the stem of the prosthesis to, in order to make it stable. It's a cemented, cement is put along uh, on the sides of it and it fixed in the cement. And this is a one piece, this is stem. This is the artificial prosthetic, prosthetic neck. And this is the head of it. This is a uh, hemiarthroplasty. Okay, let's go with the uh, and total hip replacement. It's usually done. I, if you ask me a simple question, which patients will get total hip replacement and which patients will get hemiarthroplasty? I would say one of the major factors that I've seen in the practical uh, world is that if a person, if a patient who is mobile, who is middle-aged person, not too old, and had an uh, intracapsular neck of femur fracture, um, most of the surgeons will go with total hip replacement, it gives more stability and good mobility for those people. Elderly person, uh, not too mobile, walking with a stick, walking a couple of steps in and out of the house and um, not driving, had an intracapsular neck of femur fracture, most of the surgeons will fix that with uh, hemiarthroplasty. Simple. As you can see, it's a uh, in total hip replacement, we not only replace the neck and the ball or the head, we also replace the estabulum. In we put a cap in the estabulum itself so that uh, it's the total hip is hip joint is replaced. As you can see, you might find it confusing, but you can see this is the acetabular cap, which is a separate piece. This is the head, this is the stem prosthesis and this makes the whole joint artificial okay in the previous if you can see this is just a one piece like this which has a head uh, neck and stem estabulum is natural in the hemiarthroplasty it's half hip is replaced because estabulum is the natural one which was already present there but in total hip replacement the estabulum cavity we put a, a cap artificial cap which you can see on the extra here and uh, and the separate piece of the stem is inserted with the head in it, makes artificial joint. So this is total hip replacement. Um, any surgery has complications, post-operative complications. Um, infection is the biggest thing. A big surgery, big, big wound, open, uh, done for almost one hour. So it will be infection. So it's done in the operation theater, which is a very sterile environment. And uh, prophylactic antibiotics are given to every patient to make sure they don't have any infections. Patients usually uh, land up in acute kidney injuries, so have to make sure they are drinking enough of water after operation or given IV fluids. Confusion and delirium, we have to make sure. Usually they get to land up in confusion 
because of dehydration, electrolyte imbalances. So we have to take care of all those things. Uh, DVT is very important. When a patient with a neck or femur fracture, any fracture lands up in the hospital, they are usually not allowed to walk on the leg or the limb. So you have to make sure any leg or any limb, the lower limbs, which is not mobile, has a high propensity to form uh, clot formation in the deep veins, which is called a deep vein thrombosis. And those uh, usually travel to the lungs and cause pulmonary embolism. It's not as uh, you would say, like you would never see this. It's very, very common, particularly in elderly people or you're seen on the orthopedic uh, wards or the department. Um, if, the, if not given prophylaxis uh, for the DVT, they usually end up in pulmonary embolism and you can lose a patient like that. You have done everything. You did the operation, you did the super six and everything, but you forgot to give prophylaxis for uh, DVT prophylaxis. And uh, after two or three days, patient dies because of pulmonary embolism. You did everything, everything you, you all your hard work is lost because of a simple thing, uh, DVT prophylaxis. I've got a one thing which is called stalking. It's not a female stalking, it's a different one. <laughs> It's called compression stockings here. It's just like you're stocking the people, uh, the, it's a long sock that uh, uh, we use uh, in winters or something like that. It's very really little bit tighter. It's called compression stocking. So uh, uh, females who might understand it a bit more. Uh, it goes up to the like, it has different uh, lengths, goes above the knee, but usually it's below the knee. And uh, what happens is that, Every patient who comes in the orthopedic department, we make sure, we tell the nurses or we ourselves make sure that they have the, those on. They keep compressed uh, the calf muscles. It's a very tight stocking that once you put it on, it keeps the calf muscles compressed and prevents any clot formation in that. Simple thing, saves lives every day. So after surgery is done, you did very good, hydrated, patient is back to life. And uh, the next day only, it's not like you have to wait, let it heal for two, three months. No, after the surgery, next day morning, the physiotherapist come to the ward, get the patient, get up on their legs. If they are, uh, if, if they are not dizzy, if they are not having low blood pressure or anything else, get them walking with the help of a crutch, get them help walking with the help of a stick, and that's how it is. Next day only in the morning, you will get back to your leg. And depending upon your comorbidities, your weakness, your lethargy or whatever. If a person who is young, well-to-do, I've seen 94 year old female, next day she was already up on her, up on her leg, walking with a stick. And after two days, she was discharged home. So uh, physiotherapists will come in handy in, at that place. They help those people to mobilize. Occupational therapists, they check at home, make sure they have, necessary arrangements at home, like uh, railings and everything, so that they are comfortable at home. Ortho geriatricians, uh, this, these uh, specialists are from the medical team. They check those uh, people who have broken bones to make sure, give them prophylaxis, calcium, vitamin D, and uh, bisphosphonates to make sure their bones are stronger to prevent any further fractures. Social workers, they come in handy and the patients discharged home, safe and sound. Thank you. Any questions, please let me know. Dr. Hanif, thank you so much. Um, that was a really, really amazing presentation. Um, I'm just going to ask everybody to um, please fill in um, the feedback form. I'm just trying to find it over here. Um, I'm just going to Go in the chat. There we go. Uh, I've just put in the chat, and here's a QR code as well. If you want to just uh, point your phone camera at it, it should take you there automatically. Um, guys, thank you so much. I just quickly want to go over some of the other courses that we have in place. So.